Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning as we celebrate the seventh Sunday of Easter. A special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Springfield, Clark County area, or looking for a new church home, we invite you to make St. John your new church home. As always on Communion Sundays, the entire liturgy is printed in your bulletin. You only need the hymnal for the hymns. So I ask that you please turn to page two in your bulletin to the order of confession and forgiveness. And I invite those who came without difficulty to please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Clean the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we love our men. We have not delivered our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. So we can delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. God, who was rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Now begin our worship with a hymn of glory, let us sing. Hymn number we welcome you to worship with us today. This is a video of St. John's Lutheran Church. The date of this service is June 1st, 2014, the seventh Sunday after Easter. Our theme today is the Ascension of our Lord. The Ascension was 40 days after the resurrection, and then 50 days after the resurrection is Pentecost. But this Sunday, we are recognizing Ascension. The first hymn is written by the Venerable Bede, who was an English monk who wrote the history of England and the church in the 600s, a very famous book written by Venerable Bede, and he wrote this opening hymn. We welcome you to worship St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is June the 1st, 2014, the seventh Sunday of Easter.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Ascension, 40 days after the resurrection, Ascension Day. Diane Myers. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading is from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. 
When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord. We're now singing responsibly Psalm 68. The theme is Let God let Arise. God arise and let God's enemies be scattered. Let those who hate God flee. Let us go be driven away so you should cry and have no way. As the fire comes up from the fire, so that the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad and rejoice before. will himself 
restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. singing the Alleluia, which precedes the gospel. It's our pastor, Pastor Pollock, is reading the gospel. Our organist is Greg Nolte. Joe Brewer is the assistant. We're now singing Alleluia, Lord and Savior. Our great respect for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus is standing right there with the pastor as he is reading the gospel and showing himself as he ascended Christ in heaven and has come down to us to be with us today in Holy Communion. by Joe Brewer, it's June the 1st, 2014, Ascension Day, celebrating it. He's my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest crown and strong, what hides a love. Here we go. 
Ever since Jesus ascended into heaven, we Christians have been, as the old gospel song says, standing in the need of prayer. Even with the coming of the Holy Spirit, it was poured out upon the apostles at first Pentecost and enters into us in our baptism. We still need Jesus to be prayed for. Our gospel lesson today, that 17th chapter of the gospel, according to St. John, is known as Jesus' high priestly prayer, where he prays for the disciples, he prays for the church, and he prays for those who would continue to come and follow him until he returns in glory. So today we continue to need in Jesus' prayers. We need to be a prayed for people. And the first reason that we need to be a prayed for people is because even though we are in the world, we are not to be of the world. Focusing in on that 11th verse of our gospel lesson, Jesus says, Now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Jesus ascended to the glory of the Father. He sent his Holy Spirit, and he does not command us to go off into isolation. He does not command us to go off into villages of our own where we do not allow anyone in who is not a follower of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Instead, he tells us to go out into the world, that we are to go to every village, every hamlet, and every town, and we're to baptize and teach, to proclaim the good news of the gospel. But as we do so, we are in the world, but we do not become of the world. We do not let the world influence how we worship. We do not let the world influence our beliefs. We do not let the world cause us to water down our doctrine or our biblical understanding because we don't want to draw attention to ourselves. Or we don't want to suffer persecution because we want to just go along to get along. Jesus never went along to get along. Oh, Jesus could have watered down his message and avoided conflict with the high priest and the Pharisees. But then he would have been disobeying the purpose for which his father had sent him upon the earth. And so we are to follow the example of Jesus. And that is why we need to be that prayed for people, for him to continue to pray for us so that we do not let the world influence us, but we influence the world. As Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, we are to be that light in a darkened room. We are to be that yeast that makes the whole loaf rise. We are to be that city shining on the hill that cannot be hidden. We can't do that if we become a Lord. We have to hold that distinction that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people. We have to be successful where the Hebrew children failed. God delivered the Hebrew children out of bondage in Egypt. They saw all kinds of miracles as they journeyed to the Promised Land. He opens up the Red Sea so they can cross on dry land when Pharaoh's chariots pursue them. The sea closes back up and they're all praying. When they're hungry in the morning, God sends manna. In the evening, he sends them quails. When they're thirsty, Moses strikes a rock and water gushes out. As they marched on toward the Promised Land, they had to fight the Amalekites and the Amorites and the Jebusites and, and others who don't want them coming in. And God enables them to be victorious even though they're not a trained army. Even though they have very little of any military training. And then they set up the nation of Israel. And the anointed Saul as the first king. And then comes King David, the greatest king. And then Solomon, the wisest man on earth. But as wife, Solomon becomes old, he begins to get into the pressure of his foreign wives, and he begins to allow the building of temples to false gods and goddesses. He begins to allow the people to incorporate paganism into the Jewish faith. And God was not happy. And when 
Solomon dies, the kingdom is split in two into the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah. And the people continue to allow paganism to creep into their worship of God. And these people who have been so blessed by God, who were to be the light unto the nations of the world, continue to turn their back on God, continue to allow the world to influence them until God has had enough. And in 722 B.C., the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom Israel and carried the ten tribes off into exile, never to be heard from again as the pure tribes of Israel. 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army conquers the southern kingdom Judah and takes the final two tribes off into exile for some 70 years until the Persians conquered the Babylonians allow to keep your children back to Judea. So they failed in their mission, their mission to be aligned with the nation because they were not only in the world, but they became of the world. And as the church, we face that same temptation. We face that same situation where we can become of the world instead of just being in the world. And as we look around, we see it happening. We see churches being built with no crosses in them. And we hear the excuse that, oh, if we put a cross up, it might offend somebody. The cross is a basis of the Christian faith. We hear Jesus tell us he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And yet we have something to say, well, we should tone down our evangelistic zeal. We don't want to hurt feelings of these other religions who are here. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't say go into all the world baptizing and teaching except those areas where this, for centuries the state religion has been Hinduism or Islam or Buddhism or Confucianism or Taoism or Jainism or whatever else. He said go baptize and teach the whole world. And I will be with you the end of time. Jesus Christ crucified. That is a gospel message. That Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the debt of sin that we owe so that we may be saved not by works but by salvation by grace through faith apart from works of the law. Without the cross there is no salvation. Without the cross there is no eternal kingdom. Without the cross, there is no everlasting life. Without the cross, there is no mansion prepared to you by Jesus Christ himself. Without the cross, there is no crossing to that far side bank of Jordan. Without the cross, there is no going into that land that is fair in the day, which by faith we can see from afar. Without the cross, there is no hope. Keep 
those in your name that you have given. In your translation that we read, in your insert, it says protect. The word means to guard someone, to take care of them, to keep an eye upon them so that nothing bad happens to them. It means to preserve someone, hold fast to them, to guard from loss. Jesus is praying that we will remain ever faithful to God. That we will not be like those Hebrew children who constantly fell away from God when things got a little difficult or things weren't going the way they wanted. But it's hard to imagine people who saw the Red Sea open and then close. People who saw manna every morning to eat and quail every night to eat. Who saw Moses strike a walk and pure fresh water come out so they could drink. Suddenly turn their back on God because Moses is up on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. And if you've forgotten that story, Moses goes up to the mountain for God to give him the Ten Commandments. The people down below get restless. They come to Aaron, his brother, who should have known better, and say, look, we don't know what happened to this Moses fellow. We've been down to make us a God. So Aaron tells them to give them all their gold to him, and he melts it and forms his golden calf. As Moses comes down the mountain, he hears all this rebelly and all this shouting and carrying on. There the people are dancing around the golden calf, and Moses takes the tablets and throws them against the calf and smashes it. And then he grounds up the light gold into a dust and sprinkles it in the people's water and forces them to drink it. That's funny. How in 40 days could they forget all that God had done? Yet they did. So Jesus prays that we will be more faithful than those Hebrew children. That we will be more faithful than those who would compromise with society instead of being faithful to God. He says, keep them in your name. The word that name means not just the authority of God, but it means God's revelation. It means God's word. His living word, Jesus Christ, and his written word, Holy Scripture. So Jesus is praying that we be faithful to God's word. That we be faithful to him, the living word, and to the written word. He is praying that we do not take the attitude that, oh, this isn't important, or that isn't important, or this doesn't apply to today, this doesn't apply to me, but instead that we remain faithful to that word. But we not do what so many people would like to do in this modern world, and that is just accept the parts they like, and ignore the parts they don't like. St. Augustine reminds us that when we do that, it's not the gospel we believe in but ourselves. Heaven help you if you believe it in yourself for salvation. It's God's word that brings us salvation. It's God's word that points us to the Lord Jesus Christ to hung up on the cross to pay the debt, debt of sin that we owe that we might be children of the Heavenly Father, washed in the blood of the Lamb, all eternity, that everlasting kingdom that has no end, and that mansion prepared for us by Jesus Christ Himself. And so we are praying for people, and Jesus prays for us to remain faithful to God, faithful to Him, to not turn our back, to not backslide as the Hebrew children did, to not try to change in order to make society happy. Instead, standing upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And we are praying for people as Jesus prays that we might have unity with one another. Those of you given me that they may be one as we are one. Have given. Pray to have given means to grant something to someone. To let someone have something. To entrust something to them. To bestow something on them, to commit to them. Jesus is praying that God who has given him these us and who has made us God's children, that we will be in unity with each other as the Father and the Son are in unity. He is asking that we have the unity and a harmony like the Father and the Son have a unity and a harmony. 
He's asking that we be unified so that we might be a powerful witness to the world. In the 11th century, we had the first split in the Christian church. The Bishop of Rome excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople. Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated the Bishop of Rome. So the church was split into the Eastern Church and the Western Church. Western Church became known as the Roman Catholic Church. The Eastern Church became known as the Orthodox Church. Everything was settled and fine until the 16th century. Five centuries later. Nothing ever happened in the East. But in the West, we all know what happened on October 31st, 1570. As the Reformation begins. And with the Reformation then began the Radical Reformation. And then the church began to be split and re-split and split again and split over and over again. And then church came to America and in America the church is split all kinds of times. So we have all kinds of denominations. But Jesus is praying for, even though we may not agree on everything, we do agree that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That he is the Savior of the world and that we work together to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified. See, Jesus is praying for unity, not uniformity. And there's a big difference. Uniformity means everything's the same. A ball team wears a uniform to show that they're unified together. Military, branches of the military wear uniforms to identify themselves as being together. Jesus isn't saying we have to be uniform. He's just saying be unified in me. Be unified so that we can proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to all the world and that the world will see us not fighting with one another, but praying with one another. Praying for the deliverance of the world through faith in Jesus Christ. The unity of Christians is by grace. Unity of Christians comes about by the Father working through the Holy Spirit. Unity of Christians does not come by us trying to force a round peg into a square hole. In the late 60s, early 70s, the American Lutheran Church, the Lutheran Church in America, and the Lutheran Church was in Missouri Senate, met talk about merger. The goal was to have one Lutheran church in America so that people wouldn't be confused. That when you said Lutheran, people would know who you were. If you say you're Catholic, everybody knows you. Roman Catholic. You're a brother and sister whatever Roman Catholic church in the nation. But people would go into town and see Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, Lutheran Church ALC, Lutheran Church LCA. So we met. As you know, Missouri pulled out. But the ALC and the LCA merged into what we now have, the ELCA. And it makes me wonder sometimes with the problems we've had in the ELCA ever since it was formed, that maybe we were trying to do a human unification instead of a spiritual unification. That maybe we were moving too fast. And maybe when Missouri pulled out, we should have stopped and said, is this what the Holy Spirit wants at this time, at this place, or do we need to study this matter more thoroughly? We cannot have unity just because the World Council of Churches or the National Council of Churches meets together and says, wouldn't it be great to have one American church? It's not going to happen. Unless the Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit brings us together to have such a merger. And so but that we still have unity in faith in Jesus Christ, unity as the church, unity as the body of Christ. As St. Paul tells us in Romans and other passages, when he talks about the church, he says the church is a body, just like the human body. The, as the human body has many parts, so does the church. And he uses that not only to describe the fact that there are different gifts that people have, and that sometimes God sends people with certain gifts in a certain place at a certain time for that reason, but then later on moves them on someplace else. But it also meant that the church would have unity, but not uniformity. But we, didn't have, we don't have to do everything the same. We don't, don't all have to have the same type of worship experience, but we all have to have the same gospel. Jesus Christ crucified, risen in the sea, the Lord of glory will come again.
is the living and the dead. So the question then, as Jesus is praying for that unity, the question to you is, are you helping to unify the body of Christ, the church? Are you in your daily life doing those things that help bring about that unity, or are you doing things that split the church? How you can help the unity of the church so that you can demonstrate that you are indeed a prayed for people as Jesus prays for you. First of all, pray for other Christians. Unfortunately, some denominations have a habit of only praying for themselves and thinking they're the only Christians on earth. But we need to pray for all Christians. We have a national day of prayer in which different denominations gather together to pray. That's what we need to do each day, to pray for all Christians, no matter who they might be. We need to avoid gossip. Nothing destroys the church more than gossip. Not only are you violating the Eighth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, but you are bringing about harm to the body of Christ, to the Lord and Jesus Christ, church for which he died. Third thing is build others up. Instead of harping on their faults, build them up for what they do good, for what they do well. Build them up, even if it means downplaying your role. Work together in humility. Don't work in order to bring attention to yourself. Don't work for Jesus in order that people will laud you and praise you and put your name in the newspaper. Work together in humility for your master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give up your time, your talent, and your treasure to the church so the church may be strengthened and the church may be strong. Exalt Christ whenever possible. Give all thanks and praise to Jesus Christ whenever you have the opportunity. And when you're called upon to pray, don't be intimidated by society, but instead pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't make it some generic prayer, praying to the Almighty or to the Supreme Being or whatever, but pray in the name of Jesus. And the last thing is do not let yourself be sidetracked, arguing over this divisive man. Unfortunately, we've seen too much of that in the church in the latter part of the 20th and the first part of the 21st century. Spending too much time arguing over divisive matters instead of doing what we're called to do, to preach the good news of the gospel to the world. To preach the good news of the gospel to a hurting world that is looking for salvation. And when the gospel is not heard, they try to come up with devices of their own that only plunges in deeper in trouble and further away from God. We are praying for people. Because we are the soldiers to carry on Christ's work. I pray for people. Pray for that we do not become of the world. We are in the world, but we do not become of the world. Pray for so that we remain faithful to God and not fall away from God as did the Hebrew children. And praying that we not be in uniformity, but have unity. Unity in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is why we are I pray for people. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now sing Morning Has Broken, hymn number 556. In the front or in the back. The hymn was written by Eleanor Prejean. It's a fairly modern hymn. Eleanor Prejean died in 1965. And this is an ancient Gaelic music. It's ancient music, but it's modern words. Morning is broken. This is a celebration of Christ's ascension. We celebrate that he died for us, died for our sins. He sent the Holy Spirit into the world, and he promises that when two or three are gathered together in his name, he is with us. He is with us today. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio.
for our offering. This is our 1030 service. We have a drive-in service which starts uh, Memorial Day and ends Labor Day. It's a Melody Cruise in drive-in. If you're watching this video, we invite you to the drive-in service or the 1030 service which you're watching now on the video. This is June the 1st, 2014. We're celebrating Christ's Ascension. Next Sunday will be Pentecost, birthday in the church. 40 days after the resurrection, Christ ascended into heaven. On the 50th day is when we received the Holy Spirit. The prayer was going on with those 10 days in between. We invite you to pray if you're listening to this in honor of Jesus' ascension. We're celebrating this today. And next Sunday is the Pentecost when people will be wearing red. Yeah. 
a celebration of the great Thanksgiving on page 7 in your book. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to Almighty and merciful God for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, who, enthroned forever at your right hand, intercedes for us as our great high priest. And so Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all our creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We're now singing the song to the Holy, Holy, Holy. The saints are here with us around the altar. Jesus ascended, but he left the Holy Spirit and he is with us today. Now we receive him. We believe in the real presence. Christ will be within us. Holy, 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 the saints, angels are around the altar. The pastor is preparing the Eucharist.
person going forward to take communion. This is the most holy moment in our lives when we receive a living God within us. We repent, we love God, we love one another. Jesus has ascended. He has promised to be with us. He has sent the Holy Spirit. He has redeemed us. He's died on the cross to save us from sins. We're thankful and we receive him also that he is with us right now. by Isaac Watts in 1707. He was only 20 years old, father of English hymnology, one of the pastors. His father was a deacon of the Above Bar Church in Southampton, England. This is St. John's Lutheran Church, June the 1st, 2014. We're celebrating the ascension of our Lord. This is our 1030 service. If you're watching this, we invite you to come worship with us. We are happy that you have worshiped with us today. We hope and we pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you this day in all your days. We'll pray for you, continue to pray for us. This is our service. We're no longer on cable, but we're now on our website, or we're on a video. 1030 Service, St. John's Lutheran Church. The Marching to Zion, a great hymn by Isaac Watts, written when he was only 20 years old. Amen. 